really glad to be here at the Toronto Rock Athletic uh, Center, and uh, it's a beautiful facility. And uh, to those of you watching this interview, you're going to hear balls bouncing off the boards, and that's just normal activity down here at the track. So uh, we're really pleased today to have Dan Dawson uh, here. Dan has done just about everything you can do with this game at the pro and international and senior levels. And we're going to learn a little bit about uh, Dan's history with this game and get his thoughts on the future of the game as well. Didn't start playing lacrosse until the sixth grade. Um, my best friend down the street um, played lacrosse and my dad was best friends with his dad. They were Toronto police officers together. They coached us in hockey and they thought, hey, wait a second. We want them to be NHL superstars. What do they got to do? They got to play lacrosse in the summertime. Like all the other NHL guys like Wayne Gretzky, Brendan Shanahan. So they put us in lacrosse. I started a little bit later than most kids at age 11 and I couldn't imagine what the game would do for me. Who gave you your first stick? you remember? Yeah, uh, CWS out of um, Clarkson. Um, Gary, there was a little sports store down there. My dad was friends with him. We used to buy old skates off the used rack. I never got, <laughs> never got <laughs> new skates growing up. So my dad would get in there and we ordered one of those Brian um, heads off them. And that was, my dad didn't know anything about lacrosse. It was kind of our intro and Gary um, was the first guy to kind of give us all of our lacrosse equipment. But we mainly wore, wore like our hockey equipment in the summertime. Yeah. So did you ever play with a wood stick or were you right to plastic right from the beginning? Yeah, born 1981. <laughs> I, I kind of just missed it. We, as, as a kid in grade six, um, age 11, you would see the odd kid use a, a traditional wooden lacrosse stick, but mainly it was the plastic manufactured sticks we would use. Okay. When, when did you kind of really get the bug that you thought you, maybe you'd pursue this on its own, lacrosse versus anything else? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I was a December baby. I developed late both physically and mentally later than most kids. So I wasn't very good at lacrosse until really the age of about 19. Um, you know, throughout my career, I, you know, it was a tough sport because lacrosse was such, and still is, you know, as far as numbers, not a huge number of youth who participate in the sport. So you would have a double cohort year, which means, you know, grade sixes would play with grade sevens, grade eights would play with grade nines. So it was tough for me in the underage group. So um, it took me a long time to get, you know, to find my way through the sport. I, I missed out on a lot of opportunities um, just because I wasn't good enough. And then finally, at the age of about 19, my body started to come together mentally. I started making the better decisions and um, thought that, you know what, There's, there might be a path in lacrosse for me. And, and when you were at age 19, what kind of things were available to you to pursue in the game at that year? Yeah, yeah so the NCAA was, was quite different back then. If you weren't the best, you know, top three junior A player out of Ontario, you weren't really going down south to the NCAA. Now, I mean, we're sending hundreds of kids down there, which is unbelievable. And um, that the growth of the field game here has been, un, you know, it's been great. For me, um, I didn't really know that avenue. And one, I wasn't good enough. And two, I wasn't in the top echelon of the kids in 1981 when I was that age looking to get recruited. So um, it wasn't until I met Eddie Como, who was my junior A coach, who was assistant coach under Les Bartley for the Toronto Rock. That was my first really intro into the professional game. When they moved to Toronto Maple Leaf Gardens, Eddie would give us tickets and we would go watch. And I said, hey, wait a second. This is what happens after junior. I, uh, maybe there's an opportunity for me to work a little bit harder, have the stick in my hands more. And this is maybe something I'd like to pursue. How old were you roughly when you went to see The Rock in the gardens? Uh, first game was grade 11, so it would have been about 16 years old, okay. 15, 16 years old, and it was rocking, you know, 19,000, yeah. we were top row. Um, Eddie gave us the top row tickets, uh, you know, because they were a tough ticket back then, right? Yeah. They were doing so good, so um, my friends from school um, weren't lacrosse guys, they would come with me, they loved it, and then uh, we just fell in love with the sport, and, you know, big kudos to Eddie, would give me that kind of nudge to be like, hey, there's something after you're done playing junior. Actually, did you play with your brother a fair amount uh, on the way up? Or, uh, no, there's four years between us. Four years. Paulie's in 85, I'm in 1981, so yeah. um, we played together my fifth year of junior. Um, I was in Brampton, and he got drafted to Burlington, so he was a goaltender at the time. 
Uh, he was an awesome goaltender, and I, I would shoot on him. So we, we played against each other first time ever in junior. He was a 16-year-old kid. I was 21, and uh, we always say that. Um, I got three goals on him, but he won the game. So I won the, I won the battle, but he won the war. <laughs> Your entry into the, the pro league, maybe explain how that uh, all happened. Yeah, so Eddie kind of took me aside one day and said, hey, listen, Dan, you, you, got, a, you got some talent here. You got a big frame. You're a big boy. Um, some scouts are asking about you. And um, I got drafted in the sixth round, sixth round out of seven, seven rounds. wasn't expected to make any team. Columbus Land Sharks took a shot at me. And uh, to be honest, I think I'm a product of timing and luck that um, if it wasn't an expansion team who drafted me, I don't know if I would have had an opportunity to play in my first year. So I get drafted to Columbus. They what, have year, a, what year was that? Sorry. Uh, 2001. Okay. 2001. Yeah. And uh, our open training camp was in Newtown, New York. And my dad would print me out the old map quest and I would flip through this map quest because we didn't have navigation back then. And I, I would head down to New York and um, there was roughly about 60 free agents that would go there and, and players that they signed in the off season. And I thought, you know, maybe I would have a shot. And I think from after that first training camp, I just said to myself, you know what, you know, six round draft pick. Um, I'm just going to exceed everyone's expectations. And the only way I could do that was through my work ethic. So from that chance of being drafted, I took that opportunity to be like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to look back. This is a great opportunity. I'm going to outwork everybody and prove everybody wrong that passed on me. And that was kind of my intro into the NLL. I, I really shouldn't have, have played in the NLL for over 20 years because I, I wasn't really that good back then. But I had an opportunity with an expansion team that allowed me to play 11 out of 16 games my first season. And that's when I really started to build a little bit of um, knowledge for the game and a little bit of confidence. Meanwhile, the cut right down the middle on Elliot Dan Dawson. The hat trick for Dan Dawson. Dan Dawson, you want to shoot with a fist pump. Dawson in a goalie score. Hard beat, Dawson, fake it, take it, score it. Dan Dawson, who just does Dan Dawson-like things. I picked up by Dan Dawson, scores! Number six, feeling dangerous. You know, I, I, I've known you for a little while, and I, I just remember your commitment to uh, fitness is, is really hard for anyone to match. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I realized early in my career that um, some of the shortfallings of, of my game, whether it was not knowing where to be on the floor or stick skills, I could make up through athleticism, and that's a controllable. And, and I've been blessed that I've had so many amazing, you know, trainers over the year that have guided me the way to show me how to train right and, and prepare myself for, you know, game day. My role now is I'm director of player development here at Toronto Rock organization. I do all the grassroots programming for track athletics as well. So. You know, without people like Jamie Dowick, Kurt Styers, I can go on and on. He built this lacrosse facility. It's the world renowned, the only lacrosse facility in the world that's designated to lacrosse. And all Jamie wants in return is for the game to grow. So I tell people I got keys to a $20 million facility. Now, are you kidding me? And my boys get to come in here and shoot with me and hang out with Challen Rogers and Toronto Rock players on a daily basis. We're pretty spoiled. Will you be pursuing a, another time with World Indoor Lacrosse uh, coming up uh, this fall? Or? No, you know, my, my time has come. And, uh, you know, m what I like to do now is kind of do the grassroots stuff and, and be more of a mentor to some of the young pros out there to say, hey, these are some of the techniques and lifestyles that have worked for me that gave me longevity and, and an ability to play in this league. and play this game for a long time and just pass on what worked for me. You've kind of won championships at all levels. And uh, I see one here, WLA playoff MVP. What's the WLA? Is that the Western? Yeah, Western Lacrosse Association. So um, when I was 23, um, my roommate in Arizona was Chris McKay and Noah Talbot. And they told me about this amazing place called Victoria, BC. You know, I've never been out there to the island, and they talked about these um, rivers that were like lazy rivers, natural lazy rivers, and this arena that would sell out every night, and the, the fan base and the gates were from there, and the Marichex, and I was like, well, I can go play there in the summer? I'm like, yeah, 
come play for us. Um, we lost in the Man Cup to Peterborough. And so I ended up talking to their association. They brought me out to Victoria and I uh, played in the Western Lacrosse Association for four summers. So yeah, you know, I, I met my wife um, out there. And uh, <laughs> so every day I'm reminded what this game has given me and what that place, it's, it's my second home, Victoria. And I was blessed to win two Man Cups there. And um, it's, it's just outstanding. Uh, I love Victoria. You played for Columbus first. And how long did you play with them? Um, we played two years in Columbus, yeah. and then we relocated to Arizona for four years. So technically, I was part of that franchise for six seasons. Um, amazing dressing room, great coaching staff, um, without guys like Wayne Cauley um, and those guys, Bob Hamley, Bobby McMahon, that kind of gave me my start. Um, they saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and Ronnie Roy was kind of the first coach who probably gave me an opportunity to be like, hey, you can play in this league. You obviously got some growing to do, both on and off the floor, but you have an ability to play and be an every game player. Um, so I'm so blessed that I had those opportunities and those coaching staffs that really saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. Yeah, when you played for those teams, uh, Arizona and Columbus, did you live in those communities during the season or did you just keep going back and forth uh, from somewhere? Yeah. yeah, I lived in Arizona for four years, um, for the best years of my life. You know, I worked for the team in the community doing appearances and camps and clinics. And then, you know, our main stress of the day was what we were eating and where we were working out. <laughs> and uh, it was an amazing lifestyle um, for a kid from Oakville to go live in Victoria, to go live in Portland, Oregon, Arizona, Boston, um, all because of this amazing game. So it was awesome. You know, I had my Jeep down there. Me and my dad um, drove my Jeep 36 hours of driving time um, with everything in the back, with the seats crammed like this, couldn't recline it, and uh, made it to Amarillo, Texas. And, 28 hours and then off to Arizona for uh, eight months. Wow, and where, where did you go after Arizona? Uh, so what I would do is I had the best life for three years. I would spend yeah. my winters in Arizona and then I would yeah. drive up to Victoria for the summertime oh. and then drive back down wow. to Arizona. So oh. I was like a snowbird. Yeah. And then I would live on the island in the summertime. And there's yeah. no better place in Canada in the summertime than yeah. Victoria. Yeah. And winters in Arizona weren't too bad either. So I was pretty blessed. Pretty blessed. You played for Boston. Was that after? Yeah. Uh, so after Arizona, yeah. um, they stopped operations. I was picked up in the dispersal draft by Portland, Oregon. Me and my right wife, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, relocated to Portland, and uh, we lived there for a year. And then um, once that, uh, I was dispersed again. I was on loan for a year because Arizona had a chance to come back. And then I went to Boston for three seasons. And then me and my wife relocated to Boston for three seasons before I got on with the fire department. What year was the last year in Boston? I yeah, so <laughs> last year in Boston would have been 2011. 2011, yeah. and then what was the next stop after that? Next stop after Boston, <laughs> I was off to uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, and at this point, uh, me and my wife have both started our careers. Um, yeah. I'm working for the city of Brampton in the fire department. My wife is working for the Peel District School Board and uh, we're commuters now. So every week and I'm flying out wow. and I got an amazing wife um, who supported me throughout this entire journey. And uh, it was just like, you know, she loved, she loved the game of lacrosse, didn't know a lot about it, but she saw me playing something I loved and she's like, you're living your dream every weekend, you know, let's see this thing out. So yeah, played in Philadelphia for a year, um, had some really good success there. And then after Philadelphia, it was my first time I've was ever traded which was a hard pill to swallow, but I was traded to Kurt Styers and the Rochester Nighthawks. Oh, okay. Was that the last stop or were there other stops? No, there was <laughs> a couple more stops along the way. So after Rochester, uh, I was blessed to win um, two cups there, where they were my first two cups after going to the finals um, for three seasons, uh, two with Arizona, one with Portland, and came up short all three times um, throughout my first 10 years in this league. So, you know, 10 years in the league, going to the cup three times, um, there was a time in my life where, man, this is a hard trophy to win. I didn't know if I was ever going to win it. And then going to Rochester, you know, I was blessed to win back-to-back -back cups. And then after that, you know, the stops were, um, I went to Sus Saskatchewan for a year, won a cup there, and then uh, off to San Diego for a quick season, and then ending my career here in Toronto, in my hometown. 
Oh, very good, very good. So you, you've seen it all, uh, you know, through courtesy of the NLL. Yeah, I mean, you talk about Southern, West Coast, East Coast, Europe. Um, I, like I said, I owe a lot to this yeah. game. I've been very blessed. I, every day I'm reminded that with my wife and my kids, and uh, I love it. I see you were an MLL champion. What year was that? With who? 2009. It was our first year in the MLL. Um, they brought a team to Canada for the first time. They were called the Toronto Nationals under Dave Huntley, who's obviously just... Oh, that, was that field? Yeah, field Feel, lacrosse. Oh, okay. Yeah, field really, lacrosse, okay. yeah. So they, um, they won a field championship, and they were here for three, four years, and then um, MLL kind of went a different direction. How uh, many times did you play field in the in the off season from? Uh, yeah, I wasn't a big field player growing up. I didn't start yeah. playing till I was U16 yeah. uh, for the Orangeville Generals under Dave Somerville, and didn't know a lot about field. Represented Canada once at the 2011 um, games in Manchester, England. We came up short to the United States um, by two goals and Paul Rabel at the time and uh, <laughs> Chris Sanderson's kind of swan song, a very emotional ride, um, but. Um, like I said, I just love the game of lacrosse, field, indoor, whatever it was. Well, that MLL championship, the field one, uh, that must have been interesting for you. With the, the well, I didn't play in the final game, oh. and it was tough. It was the first year I got in the fire department, 2009. So I was, you know, kind of like in and out of the lineup. I was an okay field player. You know, I was a better indoor player than I was a field player. And nowadays, there's so many great Canadian uh, outdoor players. And at the time... Uh, Dave Funley was just an awesome, awesome coach, and they had Gary Gay, John Grant. They had a, they had a plethora of amazing Canadian talented players. Wow, wow. Well, let, let's go through a, a, a couple of things here, and I'm hoping maybe you can show people. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, you won seven main cups, which is you know what a what a feat that is. And uh, I think you have a man cup uh, ring uh, here. Can yeah. you can you show that to folks? Sure. And yeah, this is second last man cup ring. Um, this is a this is a special one because uh, 2015. I I always tell the guys I've never really put rings on, so I don't <laughs> even know if they fit. But um, this is the shamrock. It means a lot. It's a great community. Um, you bleed green. We beat uh, Peterborough 4-2 in this series, and 2015 was the year my son was born, Theo Dawson. So what we decided to do, me and my wife, was that her and Theo moved out to Victoria for the summer so she could be with her mom and enjoy Theo, who was born May 15th. So I talked to the Victoria Shamrocks and thought, hey, is there an opportunity for me to commute back and forth while I was not at the fire hall? And then when I would have an extended stay, I would stay with my wife and, and Theo and uh, it was the first championship um, that I won as a father, which was really cool. And 10 years prior to that was the last champ Man Cup Victoria won, and I was on that team as well. So it was a real emotional, you know, a decade later, we won the Man Cup. Um, so, and now we're looking into 2025. I wish these legs still had some juice in them. We can maybe do it again, run it back, but I don't think I got anything left in this old body. What? Along with Victoria, what were some of the other organizations you won Man Cups with? So, very proud to say that um, I played all of my junior career in Brampton for the Excelsiors, five years, and then um, under Terry Sanderson, Troy Cordenley, they brought me onto the senior team, and I won um, four Man Cups for the Brampton Excelsiors, um, 2002, 2008, 9, 2011. Huh. And... Um, you know, 2011 was a real special one because um, we weren't supposed to win it. We went out to Langley, um, and and it was an un unbelievable ride, and won it with my brother-in-law Billy Greer, and uh, it was very special. Huh. Uh, so it was the two organizations. Or? Yeah, and then I oh, sorry, I won one more quick stint in Six Nations 2016 oh. after that Man Cup. Okay. I came back to Brampton, and uh, we had a tough season, so. I was traded at the deadline with my brother to Six Nations, and we ended up uh, winning the Man Cup four games to one versus the Maple Ridge in Six Nations, and that was my last, last Man Cup, which would have been 2016. Then you you, uh, you you won three NLL championships. and Yeah, like I said, I went to the NLL championship three times, came up short every single time, mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't know if I would ever win one. Going to Rochester, we won them back-to-back, and Rochester actually won it 
three years in a row. They won the year prior to me and my brother Paul being traded there in the off season, yeah. and then we won it two years after that. So um, it was just a real emotional time. Um, the first one was almost like a relief because we were traded to the championship team huh. and we didn't want to kind of get in the way of like, oh, if they lose, maybe it was because me and Paul got traded here. But we won, thank goodness, almost like a relief. And then the following year, we won at home versus Calgary. That was like the real emotional one of like, oh, yes, we belong here. You know, this was a real... Um, amazing time for my family because when you're chasing something for so long and then you finally see your goals and your hard work and your aspirations come together it was awesome you've been a firefighter for how many years now uh 15 years were there any other lacrosse guys with you at your uh, department that you worked for or were you the uh the lone uh pro lacrosse guy there no there's a couple of us actually and to date back to how i got into the fire service my dad was a Toronto police officer. He worked for 45 years as a staff sergeant in 23 Division Rexdale, Toronto. I was going to be a police officer my entire life. Went to school for criminology and wanted to go that route. And then all of a sudden, when I'm living with Noah Talbot and Chris McKay, and I went on to play out in Victoria, my billet was Grant Pepper. And Grant Pepper um, lived on the same street as the Gate Brothers. And Grant Pepper was a Victoria fire firefighter. Right. And that's kind of piqued my interest of like, wow, the out west fire department and playing lacrosse has always been there. Yes. It wasn't so much in the east, but now it's massive. In our department, we have my brother, Paul, who is a world-class lacrosse player. John Sullivan, who was Team Canada player, won a championship in Rochester with me. So we're very blessed. We got two all-world players huh. in Brampton. Markham Fire Departments have Ryan Cousins. Toronto have amazing lacrosse players now. Brad Cree just got on. So it's starting to come east finally. And the tradition is starting to come this way. But it's also who you are in the dressing room, who you are in the community. Like sports for me has always been a metaphor. If you're a good teammate, you're going to be great at the fire hall. And that's why it's, it's an easy transition for most guys. Is like you've been in a dressing room with 23 different personalities. Now you go to the fire hall, there's eight different personalities. It's really easy for guys to fit in. Playing for something greater than yourself, same holds true in the fire department. Is there a best player you've ever seen play the game? You know, yeah. And who would, who would you say uh, is the, that? The best player I've ever seen play? Yes. All right, I got to pump his tires. Yeah. He's uh, John Grant Jr. Yeah, John Grant Jr. is the best player I've ever seen. You know, um, the wars of Brampton versus Peterborough. Um, and the years of they beat us in the NLL final, Rochester versus Arizona. When John had the ball, he was the most dangerous player I've ever seen play the game. It was scary every time John had the ball. And to me, he had the best stick to ever play the game, and he was the most dangerous player ever to play the game. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that, that's a tough question that you may I don't say. like yeah. saying it because yeah. he's from Peterborough. <laughs> so you may have to cut that out. <laughs> You know, I know I noticed like uh, you hold you hold uh, some incredible records with the NLL in, in terms of games played. How many game? Can you remember how many games? I, honestly, I Can't don't remember. know. No. We'll have to look that one. Yeah, up. look it up. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not being coy about it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Played a lot. <laughs> yeah, played a lot. So roughly 20 seasons times, on average 16, right? So 16, 18 games. But then there's I guess there's playoff games. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm, I'm guessing close to 500 Close to 500 yeah. games, I'm sure. Yeah. All right. On the other end of it. Toronto on the power play. Dawson. Shoot scores! Dangerous. Dan Dawson makes it 3 nothing Toronto. Rogers. Dawson scores! What a quick stick by Dan Dawson, his second, and Toronto up to nine. Could have taken it to the net there, instead says, no, no, we've got a power play, I'm going to hold on to this ball, let's get our offense on the floor. Toronto working on their fifth, power play of the game, Rogers slides it over, Dawson scores! 
And and you were second in points overall. And is that still holding now? That? Yeah, it's still holding. But wow. I always I always tell people like uh, John's the best indoor player to ever play the game. He has all the records. He's the man. Um, I hope in ten years my name's not even mentioned. I really do. And and the reason why that means we're playing more games. That means there's way more talented players than I could ever be playing this game. And the game's in a really good spot. And, and I do believe in the next 10, 15 years, you're going to see people wiping out the record books. Uh, uh, yeah. And you, you were first in assists, which is, you know, means that you were a playmaker. Did you not get the same buzz out of scoring goals uh, as you did out of assists or what? I think my game evolved over time. I, I was a big power forward, goal scorer, maybe had a little bit of tunnel vision early in my career. And then... As you get older and you don't win, you start to rethink and maybe I have to develop more of a feeder game and become more of a feeder. So that's, you know, I, but again, it's a testament to all the amazing players I played with, right? Just you have assists, you give them the ball, they do all the hard work. I, I want to talk about World International Box Lacrosse, uh, Indoor Lacrosse. Yeah. And uh, when did you uh, uh, start playing for Canada in that? Yeah, it was uh, 2007. Oh, okay. World indoors um, were in Halifax. Yes. So we were coming off a crazy story. We played the NLL championship game versus John Grant Jr. the night before, and we lost by two goals. And now we're on the same flight to Halifax as teammates oh. the next day. What was the that next... like? What was that like? Ah, uh, yeah, you're, you know, representing 35 million Canadians, and and John, we have a love and appreciation for each other off the floor. Um, but during the time, it was hard to swallow. But you had to have that short-term memory, right? Very short. <laughs> yeah, and like compartmentalize what just happened and almost like not even deal with it and now focus on winning a gold medal. Yeah. I had my first start in 2004 at the Heritage Cup in Denver and I didn't, Eddie Como gave me that opportunity and I was blown away. It was the greatest moment in my lacrosse to don the Maple Leaf. You know, watching the World Juniors as a hockey kid growing up, that's all you wanted to do. And to be able to do that on the highest stage representing your country is, is the most proud of I, I am in my lacrosse career is representing my country for over a decade. Wow, wow. And, and Canada's won uh, all the golds. In, all the golds and, and, and never lost a game. It. I don't want to jinx this, you know, because... Where do you think box is going to go on the world level? I, it, we've got over 100 countries playing the game now internationally. Yeah, I think the box game is only going to go, it's, it's still on the way up. Um, there's a huge, you know, growth in the United States, which is a really good thing, scary thing for us Canadians, because they're catching us. You know, they got sheer numbers on us. Um, and they got guys like Matt Brown. They got amazing Canadians down there teaching it the right way. And you can see the gap is closing, yeah. right? Iroquois, or sorry, Hone Deshaunee is always going to be Hone Deshaunee. Yeah. Like, they're right there. It's, everyone is so good now. And the growth of the indoor game, hopefully we can take that worldwide. There was one year where I think you played the Haudenosaunee in the gold medal game. Yeah. And it was like a one goal game. Yeah, that was for like that? 2007, went to overtime. Wow. You know, Cody, wow. Craig Point, um, Mikey Thompson, um, Jeff Sawicki scored the game winning. We, we almost knew whoever won the face off was going to win the game. It was, wow. it was that good. And um, we had about 6,000 fans in the Halifax Arena, the same one that uh, the Thunderbirds play in right now. Yeah. And it was, yeah, one of my greatest moments, you know, representing your country and winning gold. Wow, wow, wow. We, we've got the Olympics coming, 2020. Yeah. It's the first time since uh, 1908. What did you feel like when you heard that was going to happen? Just finally. Like, you know, for us, this is officially the first time where we're going to be on a world stage, worldwide, right, the Olympics, and that is... Um, hopefully our defining moment in lacrosse to be like every country in the world can be like what is that stick and ball game what what is that sport and hopefully it intrigues certain nations that maybe are not participating at the international level yet and for us um, I think you'll see a huge growth in the game worldwide on top of already everything that's happening already and how do you like you know sixes has been invented 
for this. What do, you, what do you think? I love it. It's a fast game. You're eliminating the face-off. It's just like basketball, out of bounds. Let's get the play going right away again. Um, it's a combination of two of the best games, indoor, outdoor, and you meet halfway, and I think it's a lot faster. Um, I would never want to be a goalie in sixes, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, but it, it's a fun game to watch. Have you yourself played some sixes? Yeah, played some sixes here, yeah. but for me, I'm playing sixes with the little kids now. I'm in that trying to make some saves with my boys in the backyard. It's, to me, it's a lot along the same lines as backyard lacrosse. Just fun, pure, um, a little bit of structure, but you got to be able to make plays and you got to be able to think fast because it's the fastest game on two feet, they say, right? What do you think about maybe the first time an Indigenous people are able to represent themselves in, in International Olympics? Yeah, I think it's important. Um, I really do hope the governing bodies allow it to happen because it is their game. Yeah. That's the bottom line and for them to be able to showcase that on the world stage is super important. And I think they want to represent um, who they are and showcase what the game is all about of bringing everyone together. And I think it'd be a great way to do that. And uh, I think everyone wants them to be involved because they want to compete against the best and they want everyone to re re you know, represent where they're from. When you played that short time at Six Nations, did you pick anything up, say culturally, that you didn't know before? Or, uh... Oh, lots, <laughs> lots. Yeah? But yeah. you can date back before Six Nations, you know, Kurt Styers, who was the owner of the Rochester Nighthawks when we had all our success and won all those championships, he would bring a lot of those teachings into the dressing room. And for a kid from Oakville, um, knew nothing about indigenous culture, right? I didn't know where Six Nations was. You would face them in tournaments, but I didn't know where it was. And uh, over the years, you learn a little bit about the game. Then you have teammates who are from those areas. You learn a little bit more. You learn a bit about the culture and where it comes from and the medicine of the game. And, and I always tell this story um, about my dad. My dad was diagnosed with cancer. And when he went to the doctor, the first question he asked the doctor is, can I watch my boys play lacrosse? Me and my Paul are playing together in San Diego. Yeah. Not how long the treatment is, <laughs> not the outcome of this cancer. Can I watch my boys play lacrosse? Right then and there, at the age of 38, I realized it's the medicine game for us too. Oh, wow. My dad watching us play was wow. medicine for my dad. And uh, it all came together right then and there. The wow. powerful moment of understanding that my dad through all these years took so much pride in his boys, all four of his children, but us playing lacrosse in the medicine game was for us as well. And I, I steal that line from you. Is it's a starting point. It's a starting point to use lacrosse as a way because, you know, there's good and bad with the history of lacrosse, even in our own country, yeah. right? And at least we can learn from it and, and move forward with it. That's the whole idea of it because I'm still learning at 43, yeah. you know, and I'm still learning about the Indigenous side of the game. And I'm, I'm proud to say that I played this beautiful sport, but I, I still don't know everything about it. Do you have one, two, or three moments that are so crystal clear in your mind from playing this game? Uh, does any? I know that's hard because yeah. the whole thing's just a wonderful uh, blur. When I look, uh, when I look back, and um, it's been hard now. Um, there is sometimes where you get to reflect when you're done playing. But for me, um, my favorite moments are definitely representing my country. You know, winning world titles three times. Yeah at the highest stage, but also winning with my brother. You know, my brother is my best friend. Yeah. I won a world indoor championship with him. I won a Heritage Cup with him. I won two um, NLL championships with him. And I, I won two Man Cups with him. And uh, when I'm done playing, my best friend, my brother, my blood, and to share those moments with my dad, the greatest thing. It brings me joy every single day looking back on those. Yeah. and. You know, as I got older, you know, sharing those moments with my kids. I uh, didn't win too many championships um, after my boys were born, but the memories of bringing them to the rink, getting them into the dressing room, getting them around the pros, you know, those, those are the memories that will stay with us forever. Yeah. You know, you, you were an MVP at every level, you know, NLL, Man Cup, OLA, uh, you know, Western Lacrosse Association, playoffs. Uh, but you also two-time NLL Teammate of the Year. How, how was that award selected? I had to pay the guys off a lot. <laughs> I had my bank account. Um, we have a team rep 
and then they send their nomination into the league and then all depending around 13 15 teams whatever it was that season nominate one player from each team and then it goes to a voting and I always tell people when you're done playing there's there's three things one you're a great ambassador for the game two you're a great teammate and number three you're a champion if you can knock those three things off your list when you look back on your career you've done your job and for me um, you know, being a good team is something that you got to work on, right? I, you know, and um, I was just so blessed that I had amazing mentors along the way that showed me what it was to be a good teammate. You were also two-time NLL Sportsmanship Award. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean, that was, that was nice. I, I used to love in the autograph line, you know, mingling with the fans. And one of the greatest compliments I could hear in the lines is like, I like the way you play. I think you play the game the right way. I always thought that was a really... Um, cool compliment to receive after a game like they enjoyed the way I played the game and I, I thought um, looking back yeah, I wasn't perfect by any means there's times where I might have lost my cool and maybe fought the odd time but um, I like to think I played the game the right way the way it was meant to be played but again that's perspective as well I mean other people may say <laughs> differently um, but I, I just I love the game so much I just Loved it. Probably one of the highlights had to be when you're you're a captain of Team Canada, right? Like oh, that's got to be. That's. You know, are you kidding me? When yeah. when I was asked to be captain of Team Canada. What well, year was that one? 2015. Okay. In okay. Onondaga. Yeah. So, you know, we played the gold medal game at Syracuse in the dome. It was you know seeing Alfie Jack. It was a very um, rewarding experience, and uh, to be the captain to go up there and receive the trophy. Uh, representing your country, uh, it was the greatest um, accomplishment I could ever think of as a kid who picked up a stick. And, and meeting Alfie Jack, you know, yeah. was, uh, you know, one of the most incredible ambassadors for the game. Yeah. In Orwell. And I got something for you. It's amazing you said that. Oh, you didn't wicked. know that, that I had no. it for you. Yeah. All right. So hold that up. Show that to. So that's Alfie. <laughs> I mean, you can explain it better than I can, but we did a team building exercise um, at his property. He would start right. to finish yeah. Yeah. Um, what it was to make, you know, they, they say probably the greatest stick maker of all time, right? And for us, Team Canada went there. It was a really cool experience with Johnny Meridian, Andy Como, Sean Ferris, Paulie Day, all the guys that were on staff. And for um, most of the Team Canada players, we didn't understand the, what it took to make a traditional wooden yeah. lacrosse stick. So yeah. this is real cool. Dan, just a real pleasure to hear your story. Uh, anything else you want to add or you think we're... Yeah, so I, I live in Burlington now. Yeah. Um, Burlington Blaze organization is the biggest membership in all of Ontario now, which is unbelievable. And two of my boys play and uh, they love the game. And I always tell them, you don't have to play because daddy played. But um, they play all the time and... Um, they're a lot better than I ever was. I can tell you that. Yeah, they're they're fantastic players. And uh, how old are they? Yeah. Um, nine and seven. Well, okay. Yeah. So they're young and they're doing things that I, I it would be tough for me to do nowadays. So it's hard to teach them because uh, with the YouTube and all the you know role models they have here at the track and coaching them in the summertime, it's it's what this sport and the accessibility of the players is unique to unlike any other sport. And my boys are very spoiled. Um, they get this opportunity.